I think this might work. Hey, welcome, welcome. All okay, right, now I'm gonna so, surely if I lock my screen, this is gonna keep working. Let's find out. Uh, that's optimistic. You might want to use that mute mic button, mic mute button. I don't know, unless you have something else set up. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is the second uh, Twitter space that we posted from the uh, One Password account here, and uh, we have some friends from uh, Fastmail joining us as well. And so, yeah, I think uh, filling up the room or filling up the room, please stick around. We will do um, some questions and answers Q&A session at the end. So if you do want to uh, join us, uh, make sure. I think you need to be on an iPhone to get up on stage. I believe they don't have web yet. I don't know. Nick might be able to correct some of these things. It's yeah, iPhone and Android, I believe. Uh, okay. I'm going to invite the Fastmail up. Uh, count up to speak as well so that you can interact attract some more people all right cool <clears throat> so you need a phone if you want to come up and talk with a group and ask some questions but uh in the meantime we're going to get kicked off here so the very first thing we wanted to talk about was the new uh password secure sharing tool that one password just released this week and we brought along uh tanner one of the developers here at one password who uh would can introduce and kind of talk about that project. And, and in particular, I'm very impressed with uh, how fast from when we decided we were gonna start working on that to when it actually came about. So hopefully Tanner can tell us a little bit about what that feature is and uh, a little bit about the development process. And then, yeah, Tanner, go for it. Okay, hi, uh, my name is Tanner. Uh, I am a developer on our product discovery team, and the uh, item sharing project was, in many ways, our, our debut onto the scene. We've done uh, plenty of prototypes and, and things in the background so far, uh, now that we've been around for about a year within the company, but uh, this was our uh, uh, our opening night, if you will. So uh, uh, it was a lot of fun to see everyone's reactions. Uh, the item sharing project uh, actually started. I want to say back in October, uh, but we didn't break ground for quite a while. Uh, we were, have been talking about this specific feature since uh, approximately last October, and uh, we've built other things and, and kind of uh, put our, our hopes and expectations on the back burner for this one and, uh, while we did those other things. Um, and then once we had a firm idea of what we wanted to build after doing some uh, talking with, with some of our, our passionate users and um, kind of understanding how we want to build it from a technical and, and security standpoint. Uh, we broke ground uh, only a couple months ago, I want to say, and now we have it out in production. So it's really exciting to see everyone's feedback and uh, to start sharing items. It's awesome. Yeah, so I actually, for the first time in quite a while, thanks to that little COVID thing, have some family members staying with me. And legitimately, I think we launched this on uh, Tuesday, is that correct? And they yes. flew in that day. So I created a, a Wi-Fi item. You know, I put them on their own network. I don't trust my family with my network. I don't know if anybody here does, but I definitely put them on their own guest network, created a network, created a Wi-Fi item and one password with the, uh, the network name and the password. And I shared it with them. And both of these people, they're not blood related, but they're very good family friends of mine. And um, <laughs> neither of them happened to be uh, one password users, right? So this was a really cool experience where I got to take a one password item, take this password that, let's be honest, so one of them's an Android user, so I can't even use Apple's like share my Wi Fi password feature, right? And I got to basically share an item with them, and they I don't believe I've ever seen a one password item before. And they were able to click copy, paste it into their laptop or paste it into their phone and, and boom, they were on the Wi-Fi network. So it was really cool to like see that and then also see that outside of the one password ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. And that's awesome to hear because as you can probably imagine, we spent a lot of time uh, thinking about what this would look like from uh, someone's perspective who had never used 1Password before. And uh, we try to take that into consideration. So um, yeah, hopefully it sounds like it went well, and that's good to hear. Yeah, I am also super excited. 
I deal with a lot of different companies. Uh, we'll get into it. I'm the one who kind of approached Fastmail for this this uh, this integration that we did between the two companies and the number of companies that like are using some. They're actually one password users, but had no way to securely send us an item. So they would use another service. I'm really excited to like. I assume in the next couple months, the next time that happens, whether they're sharing like a development API key or something. I'm hoping that they'll send me one of these uh, share links. The one question that does come up, um, and I think it would be a cool one to address is, how does it all work with uh, different regions, right? So one password has a US, an EU, a CA region. I know some of our EU fans were a little interested in that. And I heard the database is stored over there. Can you go into any details on that? Uh, you know, I, I don't have a lot of details for you there, unfortunately. That, that isn't necessarily my domain of expertise. Um, I don't know if, if someone else is here, potentially, I think I saw Rob in the chat. Uh, he might be able to jump on and talk a little bit about that. Um, but unfortunately, I'm not the one you want to ask. Perfect. Now nobody knows that this was scripted because uh, <laughs> <laughs> just asked you a question you couldn't answer. So obviously yeah. this wasn't scripted. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming and talking about, uh, oh, here's Rob. He's coming up as a speaker. Uh, for those of you who don't know Rob, he's been here for like 27 years, and he's one of the smartest people at this company. So, Rob, welcome to the stage. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so your question was, like, what, how does it work with different regions? Yeah, I was very curious about, like, so one of the reasons to use, like, the EU region is because you don't want your data outside, you know, stored on a U.S. server or something like that. So I was just kind of curious how, yeah. how you all set that up and how, you know, why it's only one region, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, um, it is, so the, there is only one and it's shared at one password.com. Um, but that, um, that's actually hosted in the same place that, um, one password.eu is hosted. So it could have been shared at one password.eu. Um, the data and the service is in Frankfurt, Germany. Um, but we decided to go with only one uh, because it's simpler. <laughs> um, so you have, you know, one place to um, to put things. And, you know, maybe if we had, um, or like, if we were setting up one password.com um, now, we maybe we would have gone with one region and put that in the EU as well. I don't know. Yeah, no, that was that was the, the point I was trying to get across. I, I did not know that until I saw it on a random Slack message that we were actually hosting all this data in the EU, which was very interesting. So the folks that don't know, we've uh, we kind of started on uh, US. We added on the Canadian and the uh, EU region. That was really cool because this is kind of the first, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the first feature where it's built outside of the typical one password server. And but all of the regions kind of use this. And I think the term we've used internally is like kind of Switzerland. And, and we've thought about kind of expanding that so that what happens if one region needs to talk to another region without passing data through, say, the U.S. or Canada or something, right? Right. That's that's basically how it got started. It's not the first feature to to work that way, but it is probably the most visible one. Awesome. Thank you for answering that question. Cool. I know Phil's here. Is anyone else? Uh, Mitch, someone else want to talk about item sharing? Uh, yep, Mitch is raising his hand. Let's talk about item I mean, sharing, I, Mitch. I got, a, I got a question about item sharing, actually, or a question awesome. that I've seen a lot of people ask, which is, uh, how, how is this thing safe? Like, you're sending a link over the internet, and it has an item. Like, how is it possible that, like, one password from everyone else in the world just can't go to go see this item without your permission? And yeah. I love it if um, you get the deets there, Tanner. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so that was the the number one concern when we started looking at this, right? Like, uh, one password's security model is built on us never being able to look at your data, and we didn't want to change that for this feature, and we never want to change that to be more uh, precise. Um, and so that was what we looked at first, and what we walked away with was a system where uh, the URL itself contained. Uh, a couple properties, but uh, one of the things we derive from it is the decryption key. So when you go to share your item, uh, it's obviously encrypted uh, or, or decrypted, I should say, at the point when the individual is sharing it. And what we do is we just uh, spin up a new key, uh, encrypt it, and uh, use that key, uh, place it in the URL, uh, in, in a URL fragment. Uh, and when that is shared, uh, notably, it's not shared over our servers. So 
we're not emailing it to anyone for you. Uh, and again, that is so we don't have the key because that would uh, allow us potentially to gain access to your data. Uh, so what we do is we ask you to share the link uh, however you decide necessary. Uh, and that, that allows us to not look at the key. Uh, and the item can be decrypted on the other side without us ever knowing the key to unlock the door. Uh, and then past that to make sure that, uh, you know, people you don't want looking at the data, uh, you know, outside of us, of course, uh, you can specify users' email addresses. And so that is a server-side enforcement. And so when they uh, want to prove that they are, uh, you know, the person that you shared it with, they enter their email address, they get sent a six-digit code, and they verify their identity that way. Um, so it, it's a, a little cherry on top. So past the encryption layer, we've got the server-side enforcement layer, and uh, they both work together to make sure the data gets to the right place. Yeah, I think that's one of the really cool things about 1Password, right? So we design, like we always end up at this like encryption first, authentication second approach, right? So this has a little bit of both, but most importantly, you know, we essentially went out of our way to never know that encryption key. However, it doesn't make the best, most perfect user experience, right? I think we can all agree. If you could type in an email address and click send right there from the, uh, the share sheet, um, yes. that would be slightly better. But it would also mean that at that point, the 1Password servers, potential insider threats, external threats to 1Password could get that key, right? And that's the, that's the thing where it's really hard, especially if you're using this on a web or you're using this in an app to realize that like, we never actually can decrypt that item that you're sharing, which is really cool. That's exactly right. So like, where, where's the cryptography happening then? Who, is it happening on the server? Is it happening on my computer, the recipient's computer? Yeah, it's it's happening on both. So you you encrypt it uh, on your own computer. It never leaves your device decrypted uh, again. So our, our servers can never look at it. Um, and so we just get that encrypted body uh, on our server and we store it there. Uh, and then it's decrypted again on the recipient side. And so uh, one password can never see it. Pretty neat. And that's just all in the browser on the recipient side of their computer decrypts it. Yep, that's correct. It's just some JavaScript. Yeah. Doing going to going to work. I think something that we kind of skipped over, or or not skipped over, but said really quickly that some people might not understand, um, is the URL fragment. So that's the that's the part after the hash symbol in the URL, and um, it's just a it's a cool feature of URLs because that doesn't get sent to the server. Like when you make you type that into your browser and hit enter, that part of the URL is not seen by 1Password at all. It stays right there in your browser. And so that's where we store the, um, the secret that we use to get the encryption key. Yep. Did you guys invent this? Like, I, I, is, this, is this new ground in um, Secure Serum? Because this is, this is fantastic. That's a great question. Uh, there was a lot of deliberation. Uh, I don't know if, if uh, we are necessarily magicians in that regard. And this is definitely only one of a few different approaches that we uh, we were talking about in the very beginning. Um, but I, I don't happen to know if anyone else is actually doing this or not. It's not new to us, no. Um, yeah. There, um, There's at least one other service that I know that does something similar, but I'm sure there are others. But just the UX makes it feel like you don't have to know any of this. You just it, it feels just like sharing a link, and yet it's just a thousand times more secure than like sharing a Google Doc or something. And that's I think what's so phenomenal about this feature, it's it's easy to do sharing. It's hard to do sharing that's truly secure. Yeah, I remember a couple of years ago, actually, seeing a prototype of a feature like this. And there was all sorts of wild things where you would have to like go to the website, either create a key that would be stored in local storage and then pass that to the person who would encrypt the item and then encrypt it and then send it over. And uh, as most of you probably realize, we did not ever ship that. But this is definitely, I think we landed on a place where it is that easy. You take a link, you share it on Slack or iMessage, hopefully, or Signal or something where you actually trust that there's some end-to-end -end encryption there. And uh, it's a pretty pretty safe way to actually share some some secrets. Yeah, yeah. When we started looking at this, the, the number one thing we kept reminding ourselves was that we wanted it to be as simple as a copy and paste. And there were plenty of solutions we suggested that 
uh, you know, maybe could have been like uh, 1%, 2% safer, you know, in that regard, or at least uh, made you feel like you had more control there. But at the end of the day, if the user can't use it, then they just might end up copying and pasting these fields into a text message or something like that. And so uh, the number one thing we kept reminding ourselves was that uh, we wanted it to be as easy as a copy and paste. And I feel like we accomplished that here. Absolutely. Phil, you have something you want to add from the design side? Sure. Um, well, I wanted to build on kind of what Tanner was, um, was already saying, and that's really that, you know, there was a lot of different considerations that went into designing this feature in the sense that um, we are competing with copy and paste, right? And so how do you make an experience, especially since even already with 1Password, it's, it's quite easy to just, you know, quickly copy from the fields um, in the apps. Um, so we, we went through a lot of, like a ton of iteration on just kind of balancing the right number of conf you know configurable um options to your share um but again trying to kind of drive home that um you know ease of use um because again copy <laughs> our number one competitor was copy paste and then you know in the distant distant uh, taillights of that was uh you know our competing services that do this sort of thing because again we it's not easy to make something that is both um super simple but also secure and i think to a certain extent you know we need to try to and uh, convey to the users just how secure this is compared to other uh, you know other uh, mechanisms and also just remind people that you know text messages aren't aren't necessarily as secure as they might or as private as they, they think they are yeah absolutely the other thing i want to hit on and and i do you know want to worry about time and i promise fast mail friends we are getting to you you know I love you. Um, but one of the really cool things about this feature is I think it's the one of the first times where we now have the same set of code that is basically when you go to the, uh, the share service and you go to share.1password.com or if you open the browser extension or you open 1Password8, it's actually the same background code that is creating those item details that you see there. And we're using a ton of the same front end components as well. So I think for me, this is like, I remember when, you know, the folks first started working on this feature, I was looking at the mockups and I was like, why aren't you using what we call the core UI and core item details? Like this is the perfect opportunity. And I'm so happy that uh, especially Tanner and, and, and Nick here got together to basically make that happen. So when you see an item that's drawn on share.1password.com, that's the exact same item that you'll see drawn in the browser extension and in the uh, 1Password 8 desktop apps. And so we're doing that by essentially compiling some really cool Rust code to WebAssembly and that's running in a, uh, in a web worker and the item details are passed in and essentially the entire front end, correct me if I'm wrong, Tanner, but it was fairly easy because you pass in the item you get back exactly how to display it. And we gave you the kind of React components and exactly how to show it, so. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. And uh, I think the coolest part is that we we actually were using uh, that same WebAssembly code uh, already on, on our web app there to, to generate TOTP codes. Um, but that was very much a, a proof of concept that uh, we did once like a year ago and we're like, this would be cool in the future, but uh, we never really came back to it. And so this item detail view and, and all the logic that we're borrowing from your team uh, was kind of the the next big step in that uh, in that uh, I don't know what, what's the word I'm looking for here approach, which was which is really cool. And because of that, we got out of the box a lot of awesome features that our web app doesn't support yet, like uh, like dragging fields out of the out of the um, uh, out of the, the item detail into a field. I, I know Mitchell shared, uh, or Mitch, I should say, uh, shared a, a video of that earlier. And um, all of those things just kind of came with it. Uh, and it was uh, beautiful. It worked exactly like it was supposed to. Yeah, and I can tell you, it, it, it was a long road to get to this point. And we have not crossed that barrier where like, look, we write one piece of code and literally run it everywhere. But it's really awesome to see this essentially brand new service. It's it's running on its own infrastructure. It's got its own web app, and all of it is kind of powered by the exact same code that we're using in the uh, in the browser extension now, and and using in the one password eight desktop apps, which is really cool. Yeah, very cool.
yeah, I think part of this too is trying to make the user experience cohesive between uh, all of our products, and that's kind of you know a goal we're working towards. But um, yeah, when it became feasible to use the um, this view within the uh, the sharing service, um, I think that that really helped helped us get us over the line. Ira, before we move on, uh, maybe as a segue, I was wondering if you or, or maybe Nick wanted to talk about how we actually also integrated the browser extension into this experience of item sharing. Um, yeah, sure. You want to take that one, Nick, or you want me to uh, take it? It was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, you go for it. It's pretty cool. Uh, so it's kind of funny. Neither Nick or I did the hard work. <laughs> so uh, I ha we had the dream, and, and I'll give full credit to uh, Dave Tier for this. But um, <clears throat> we've been working on this concept where we want to get more of people's digital lives into one password, right? So we actually have an NPM package. You can go find it on NPM um, at one password forward slash save button, I believe. And it's basically this, this API that allows you to embed this little tiny bit of JavaScript, construct this JSON blob and send it directly to our, our browser extension. And what the browser extension will do is it will parse that and offer to save an item, right? And, and so we've used this um, <clears throat> with some partners like ramp.com and our integration with privacy.com actually works this way in different ways. So privacy.com, when you go to their dashboard and you click that button, it actually goes to their server, provisions a bear token puts it into that um, JSON object and sends it to our extension. And that's how we kind of get you authenticated with uh, privacy. I will admit, I like the OAuth flow of Fastmail a little bit better more, and we'll go into that. But it is a really cool tool because you can imagine like, for example, wouldn't it be cool, we use GitLab, if we can go to GitLab, the API page and click a button and like save an API key directly into one password. So <clears throat> here, I think it took, two days or so from when we first started talking about it to when we actually merged the code and got it there. But essentially one of the really cool things about you know, share.1password now is when you land on that page, if you have uh, the latest 1Password browser extension installed in your browser, you can actually just click a button and it will prompt you to decide which account and which vault you wanna save it in. And we're actually using the same exact kind of technology that we are releasing openly for other people to kind of use and embrace. And the end state being, you know, there are way too many services. Another one I can think of is NPM itself, right? I go to NPM JS, I go provision a new API token. And what do I do then? I have to copy and paste it and hope, you know, I'll be honest, sometimes that goes into sublime document and doesn't end up in the safest, most secure place, right? So that in, tone, in, in turn with our, our kind of wishes to automate more um, secrets across your uh, infrastructure is kind of something that we inadvertently got to use here because we already developed it, but I think it's a great kind of implementation of it where any item that's shared with you, if you're a one password user, you can just save it directly into one password. So it's pretty cool. It's really great for kind of an account to account sharing, right? So oftentimes we're working with another company or you know, maybe I send something to my lawyer or whatever, and they would be able to just save the secret that I sent to them directly into their one password account, which is really cool. And then you're taking all the clipboard out of the equation, right? So you don't even have to reveal the secret on the DOM. You don't have to copy it to your system clipboard. You can just save it directly into one password. So you can you can share items with people who don't who've never heard of one password, like like your family, like they don't use it. Yep. But if they were then to be like impressed enough to get one password, it would be really easy for them to also just the, the experience would get even better. They can then add it to their own one password right there from the page. Yep, absolutely. And I do this all the time. I, you know, I share some accounts with random family members. I think you just the other day sent me an account that I needed to use for some work project, but um, yeah, so it's a perfect use case for that. And it was one of those things where <clears throat> these uh, these folks that were building the share service were basically a little bit ahead of schedule. So in the last week, we kind of added and tacked this on and, and we got it in, which was really cool. All right. So I think that's enough on share. Like I said, I want to leave enough time for questions. 
at the end. The other thing we wanted to talk about, and we kind of saved um, this all for, you know, one nice conversation. We probably had enough content to have a Twitter space when we launched it. But for those of you who don't know, and I believe my friend uh, Nick has been posting tweets at the top so you can see some of the things we're talking about. But for those of you who don't know, we just recently launched a integration with fastmail.com. And specifically, uh, this is the ability to link your Fastmail uh, account to one password. And from there, you can create new masked email addresses as you're signing up for various services online. So um, oftentimes, I might be in the minority here, but I go to a lot of different websites that I don't even know if I'm interested in. But I ultimately hit one of those login sign up pages to even see what I'm going for. And this is a really great tool to essentially, you know, create and automatically fill and then save a new email address. And from there, it gives you two big things in my mind. One is, um, you know, you don't have to provide your your email address that you use for everything, which, you know, for those of you who don't know, but if your email address gets hacked, that is a very easy way for people to um, reset passwords, gain access to a bunch of accounts. So like your email is one of the places you definitely want to have one of those kind of unique and secure passwords, but it also gives you a little bit of privacy benefit as well, right? So if they don't know, uh, if you don't know, but they definitely do, a lot of services, whether you're, you know they're within the same family of brands or they sell your information, but they basically, email addresses is a great way to kind of track you as you go along your journey along the web. And this integration is a really great example, I think, of where we were actually working on kind of doing something ourselves. We were, we were thinking about basically creating something like this directly in one password um, and, and essentially being able to create email addresses and then have those forward to your email. And I think my Fastmail friends already know this, but maybe not everybody knows this. Running email services is a lot of pain. There's a lot of stuff you have to worry about with regards to getting your IPs blocked and and having domains that are valid and holy cow, it's like it's it's really a pain. Um, so we really quickly kind of we we invested a little bit into that path, and then one of our founders, Rustum, had said, "Hey, you know, I really want a different email address for every single one of my login items. I want it to last forever, right?" And that is something where like one password, if we were working with a third party to run the email servers or if we were running them, that's a huge commitment, right? Like that's a huge commitment. And so um, he had mentioned like, hey, have you seen this fast mail thing? They, they already offer like, you could have 600 email addresses. Maybe they would be a perfect person to kind of propose this idea to. And sure enough, I looked at it. Honestly, I'd never used fast mail before. Um, I am now a fast mail customer with three year subscription, but I'd never used it before. And uh, you know, this is a great example. I think there's different things to talk about. We can talk about the technology, which I really want to, how we're using kind of these open standards to have this interoperability. But also, I think a really cool part of this is, this was a complete, like, I sent a random email to a random Fastmail address. I think it was like partnerships at Fastmail. It actually got rejected, uh, <laughs> got sent back to me. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'll just like contact their support. But I just sent an email and said, hey, I'm some dude from 1Password. We kind of want to do a thing. What do you all think? Ultimately, we want you know as many people to have access to this feature as possible from as many email services. You know, Can we develop something in tandem? And that was the very first time that uh, I heard about this thing called JMAP and how Fastmail was actually very different from every email service I had ever used, using IMAP or heaven forbid, POP3. And you know, within about a week, I was already like, holy cow, I don't know why we're not using this for everything, <laughs> but that's another story. But either way, I think within a matter of about four months or so from when I first contacted them, we launched this uh, this integration with Fastmail. And um, I'm not sure if I gave that enough justice. So I'm gonna hand off the mic to anyone else who wants to explain a little bit deeper on the technical side. Um, how about someone from the Fastmail side talk? 
Yeah, I had to find my mic button. Hey, this is Rick. From hey. Mail. Uh, how's it going? So we, uh, yeah, we got this this contact from from you. Gosh, was it four months ago? I, it was like four ish, four or five months ago. Yeah. It was in fact, I brought up, I, I searched, I searched my mail archive. I see April one is the very first contact I that ever got to me, uh, which is, uh, yeah, it's, it happened fast. And when we had this conversation, uh, pe- people occasionally will say, "Hey, fast mail, do you want to work with us on something?" And it often becomes, you know, do you want to? Do you want to build something for us that will run exactly the way we think it should be run and will uh, not really not really fit with the fast mail philosophy of building things? And we kind of want to lock people to, into our product and, and have you help us do that. And, you know, we have a conversation about it. But I think almost the first thing that came out of your mouth when we had this conversation was – we want to build this. Uh, we want to build this in an open way that lets users maintain control of their data and be fast mail customers who get benefit out of being being using both systems. And it was kind of like the clouds parted and the sun shone through. And I was like, "This is somebody I want to work with." Um, and I think I think that's how it went. I think it was pretty great. Um, also, in that conversation, I think that I ended it by saying, "Look, we're, we we can implement the API however you want, but I really want to talk to you about JMap, which is." basically what i say to anybody who wants to do anything with fast mail and um you can tell me i feel i feel like i've gotten a we are we're happy with that technical decision uh from the one password side since then but uh we yeah, we threw together some some oath and we threw together some jmap and uh and got this working in a way that i think has been really nice and uh and open and kept people able to, to keep using this as long as they want yeah i think the thing that where we both did our best i think is we developed a system and from day one honestly i was like you know what we explored it we don't want to own any of this email stuff like we don't want that that headache right um and for those of you who don't know fast mail has been around for like over two decades now or did you just celebrate 20 years i can't we, remember we turned 21 in august yeah so it's it's not like a fly fly by night shop over there you know what i mean i, I feel like if you sign up for a fast mail account you'll probably You'll probably have that for a little while, but um, the the thing that's really cool where we landed, and I think we, we went back and forth, like, how are we going to handle this? How are we going to handle that? But essentially, there's almost no knowledge on either side of, like, who that FastMail customer is, and FastMail doesn't know who that 1Password customer is. And we did that with things like OAuth and by developing a protocol that really just doesn't doesn't send any customer data between the two companies, which made everything a lot easier, right? Like we didn't have to really tweak our privacy policy because this is something where you go opt in and you, you, you kind of authorize your account to be added. And it really makes it a really seamless experience. And it's pretty exciting to use actually. Yeah. I, uh, it is, it's very nice to use. And uh, like you say, we, we haven't had to worry about trading any customer data. The, the number one principle is if you're worried about what's going to happen when you lose your customer's data and they realize that you're an idiot who lost their data, why don't you start by not having it? Uh, and we were, we were able to do that pretty successfully. It's been a, been a pleasant experience, low stress. So I might I might pronounce this wrong, and I do apologize if I did, but it is, it's Boren, right? Boren or Bron? Boren? Bron. See, yeah, Bron. Sorry. Sorry, Bron. I apologize. One of the cool things out of this launch that I saw is – Went over to Hacker News. It was actually fairly well received on Hacker News, which is kind of unheard of sometimes. <laughs> yeah. But Ron there, he he literally just posted like, here's the request and here's the response here. He basically just wrote some API docs for exactly how the integration worked. And I think that speaks to the simplicity and the openness of it, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think every everything that we do, we try to make pretty straightforward in what we're doing and how it works and also trying to get it across the line for other people to use we as you mentioned right we built jmap for um for replacing imap uh and we're trying to use it to replace caldav and cardav and a bunch of terrible protocols that make the internet a lot less fun to work on and we're using them now we're using them today and as soon as we figure out a just just what makes them right, we kind of say, great, everybody else, please, please use it. Here's the API, do whatever you want, because it's it's your data. You should be able to do what you want with it. We're just here to help. I think maybe Nick can find the tweet. He's the, the tweet finder and pinner in chief. And I think one of the cool things about the launch was 
I, you know, Rick had sent me like this YouTube video. It only had maybe a couple hundred views of this talk that he gave where he actually explained like, uh, let's be honest, how old or how bad IMAP is and what <laughs> JMAP brings to the party. And I, if you're a developer and you think about any sort of interoperability or syncing system or you're into GraphQL even, like you should go check out that talk because the jokes aren't great, but the content is, is <laughs> freaking awesome. Like it's really, really cool to see like, because we don't think about it, right? Like I just type in IMAP dot whatever and it basically works, but um, the the inefficiencies and, and how that actually has to be implemented is, is just wild to think in this day and age. Yeah, and the thing, the, the bell I like to ring about it is, you're right, it's like there are inefficiencies and there are, it's very easy to write bugs when you're writing a very big, complicated piece of software using these standards. But the thing that really gets me going is if I learn how to program, I'm a, I'm a new programmer and I know how to do lots of things with all the simple JSON-based APIs that basically power everything on the internet. The one thing I'm still locked out of is my mail and my contacts and my calendars, uh, my to-do lists, right? Like the most central items of how I organize my life and my day require the use of these incredibly terrible protocols. And we have allowed this to persist because nobody has had uh, sort of the, the crazy idea that it could be replaced. And in fact, when I saw JMAP first proposed, I said, well, it's a great idea, but it's never going to happen. Um, and now here I am telling you it happened. It's, it's pretty great. And I think it's going to give a lot of people power over their lives yeah i want to ask you some jmax map specific questions but before i board the group mitch you had your uh, <laughs> you had a question oh i just wanted to know like because i actually don't know the answer to this what what exactly is jmap i know what json is i know what imap is i can't figure out how to combine those two concepts into something yeah, that makes sense yeah a quick overview of what jmap is and, and where people can find more info would be awesome right yeah, okay. I, I will be brief. I, I know that I'm much more excited to talk about JMAP than many people are to hear about it. JMAP is, uh, gosh, it's an acronym, and I'm sure it stands for something. It's the JMAP Message Access Protocol. It changed at some point, and I'm, I should probably be ashamed I can't tell you, but it's a protocol. And it's a protocol that's based on HTTP and JSON. So it's something that every programmer these days is dealing with. And it's meant to replace IMAP for mail, the SMTP submission mechanism for mail, uh, CalDAV and CardDAV for uh, contacts and calendars. But the, the real heart of it is it's a, it's a way to say, I know you have some of my data server, and I'd like you to give me some of it, and I'd like you to update some of it. And you can do that extremely efficiently. So you can just say, tell me everything new since the last time I came online, and you're handed just the updates to the data. Or you can say, I want you to do a search, and after you've done the search, I want you to fetch the data, and after you fetch that data, I want you to fetch some related data. So you can give it multiple actions to perform at once, the server will do all of them and hand them all back to you at once. So in some ways, it's just doing stuff you already could have done, but we've ripped out terrible data formats, we've ripped out many, many multiple round trips, and we've made the whole thing look like everything else in it. So it's not, well, cards look one way, and the card protocol looks different than that, and emails look different than that, and the email protocols look different again. It's it's one set of ideas that allow you to operate with all your data. I don't know if that answers your question. No, I mean, that's like the multiple actions is the part where like you can develop that in a different ways. What's cool about that is it's built into JMAP, right? So you essentially, even, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when you render the... Um, the the fast mail uh, web app, for example, you can say like, give me some user preferences about this user. Also give me like their first 10, 15 emails so I can draw the, uh, the sidebar with their yeah. emails. Also give me the one email that is already open, so the, the newest one and give me the content for that email all in one single request. Yeah, you nailed it. And so that is where it's like, we at 1Password don't even have that. Like we, you know, we've designed a lot of our own sync system, even in the 1Password 8 apps, Right now, we do a lot of round trips, and the round trips obviously pay a higher cost when you're sending all of that over a network, right? Yeah, absolutely. And you're doing it over TCP, uh, and you're doing it over the radio, right? Like, it's there's lots of things that make it a pain. And who wants to implement that, right? Implementing a mechanism to batch all of these things together, and, and by the way, not just batch them, but let 
you know, you send five requests and each one depends in part on the output of the first one on the server side, it's a, it's a pain in the butt to implement for whatever protocol you happen to be building. But if you built it once, and that's your core protocol for building everything else, everything you do just got a lot more powerful. And the cool part here is like email services can implement part of JMAP, can slowly implement it. Even if you don't run an email service, you can implement and use JMAP as your server side and client side kind of protocol and send really anything you can send over JSON over JMAP, right? Absolutely, yeah. the the first the demo app I think you can find. Oh, you asked someone asked where uh, where to find more about it. And uh, the website for JMAP itself is jmap.io. You can read the spec and you can see some some videos there. Um, and there's a demo app. I, I'm not sure if it's there or if it's in another repo, but it uses JMAP to implement basically a to do list. And it's nothing to do with like real calendar to do list. It's just a it's just a goof. And it works because you can say, I've got some JMAP objects. I want you to store them. And when I update them, I want to have efficient updates and I want to synchronize them and it all just falls out. You can do for, do whatever you want with it. Yeah. Does that answer your question much? So from a developer perspective, that sounds amazing. How does JMAP let Fastmail and, and us like build integrations in ways we couldn't before for users? I I would say that the the thing about it is we could have built the one password fastmail integration using any any API. Um, so I don't I wouldn't go so far as to say without JMAP we couldn't have done this, right? We could have built it with whatever uh, whatever API pattern is hot this week. The idea of using JMAP means that when one password wants to synchronize data into itself, it can synchronize that data efficiently. It can just say, hey, what's what has changed in my masked emails? We can uh, add more functions in the future without decreasing the efficiency of the protocol. We can just pack in all the requests that that are needed. Or if you're operating offline and uh, you're you're messing around with your data in one password and you need to synchronize later, you aren't. There, there was no extra work for one password to say we have to store these changes in some weird way to batch them for later. That that concept of having offline storage is built into the JMAP model. So. Uh, I think it, it makes the system have a lot of desirable properties as opposed to being possible at all. The, the possible is always there. And, I mean, I think a question that has come up, and we've both kind of beaten around the bush a little bit, but we talked about it, is the fact that you haven't created anything that requires one password to work, right? Like, if someone can OAuth with uh, Fastmail and they have their OAuth token has access to use mass email, they can essentially create a client that can create and use this, this new mass email feature, right? And on the opposite side, any email service could potentially expose a JMAC function for mass email and, and do OAuth. And, and that could be something that would work with one password, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think I what's one of the conversations we had the first day was that we wanted to do this in an open way. Um, you know, when people bring their email to Fastmail, they aren't giving us their email. They're not giving us their 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 lives, right? They're they're we're being stewards for them. We're holding on to the data, keeping it safe, and we're helping them organize and deal with it. And if they decide someone else can do that better than us, they should be able to take that data wherever they want to go. And if we want to offer masked emails, that should be part of it, right? If they want to say, I want to be able to take this, go to some other service and have them manage it, they should be able to do that. And when you're building a new feature, though, you can't just say, well, we use the standard for that. You have to make the standard for that. And so uh, we hope that's what we've done, right? We've, we've written how we think this can and should work. That's what we implemented. We handed you a specification for it. It, it looks a lot like the JMAP specification, although it's you know, quite a bit shorter than, than the ones that we sent to the Internet Engineering Task Force. And uh, at some point, I'd love to be able to say, look, here's, here's the standard. Anybody who wants to integrate with this, go ahead. That's, that's why we built it that way. Yeah, that's really awesome. Mitch? So it, it sounds like um, there's really a possibility for a much richer set of integrations than even mass email, like as cool as it is. I mean, I don't want to start asking about future plans or anything. But <laughs> mm, yes, yes. We, I think we exercise some, so <laughs> for those of you who don't know, we also just released a uh, iOS web extension. Um, and that was my team as well working on that. So there was a Twitter space that's on the One Password YouTube channel. If you want to hear us talking about that in a similar format as this, you can go listen to that. But I think... <laughs> We were, I think when I first got on the horn with Rick and Helen, we were dreaming 
big, you know, talking about like how many businesses could connect and have this all set up. And like, it's very easy to like make a lot of complications. And I think we did really well on landing on a feature that everyone can use. And from here, we're actually planning on expanding that further into 1Password, right? So we, we wrote a lot of this code. It can be used in the new 1Password 8 desktop apps. We have to go and finish that up and actually release that. Um, but I think, you know, you should be able to create one of these masked email addresses anywhere in 1Password. And from there, one of the cool things about building this off of JMAP is you're absolutely right. There are other feature possibilities there. So for example, if we're already using this protocol and we want to add on a feature, it's really just kind of updating that OAuth token to get another, you know, potential, uh, um, I don't know what you call them. I apologize. My brain is slipping endpoint or, or uh, a request type. Yes, a, a scope or capability. A scope, yeah. another yeah. capability, and then we can bring more in. And that is what, like, I think, you know, we have to go through marketing and we have to talk a lot to a lot of people. But to me, this wasn't bringing mass email to one password. This was integrating Fastmail into one password. And mass email just happens to be the feature for launch, right? So we can absolutely kind of expand on this, um, which is really cool. So let's uh, let's talk yeah, more about the, the user experience of that that feature a bit because I think um as as cool as like the future possibilities are, it's 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 so wonderful to have today. And I just um from my experience of it, the first thing I noticed was how delightful the the suggested aliases are. That that actually funnily enough got me into it more than anything else. And I wonder, are we using the one password password generator for those or the fastmail password generator for those? I'm going to yield that question to either Nick or Madeline who wants to go into that or, yeah, anyone anyone else start talking. I want to get more, a wider group, please. Hey, folks. It's uh, Nicola here from Fastmail. Um, I actually was responsible for in inputting a lot of the words into our dictionary that generates those random addresses. Um, they're generated on the Fastmail side, not not on the one password side. Uh, and I was thinking about wanting to make sure that when people use their master email addresses, while they weren't intended to be memorable in the way that, you know, a good strong password is often not memorable. Um, I wanted people when they, you know, in one password, when you click that button to say, generate me a master email address, uh, it comes up with a suggested option. And, and just like with passwords, you can regenerate them um, for reasons that I don't know, people just like picking their passwords and they like picking their email addresses. And uh, I wanted to make sure that when you generated your email address, it, it made you feel good that, that you would look at it and go, yes, this is, this is the experience I want in my life. Um, and so, yeah, I see that it with things that would bring me joy and it's just been delightful seeing people around, uh, around in the Twitter space also just finding that little piece of joy in the, in the masked email. It's awesome. Yeah, and and because mass email can is essentially you can use just a regular fast mail account with a fast mail domain. It made a lot of sense for them to kind of provision that to make sure that you know you weren't getting a duplicate on that end, right? Um, one of the coolest features for me personally, as kind of a geek who has way too many domains, is you can go over and add as many of them as you want to fast mail, which is already a great feature but then you can actually select. So I have one domain that I only have my mass email addresses generated on, and then that gives you pretty much complete portability there. So if you wanna take that domain and move it somewhere, or, you know, heaven forbid, fast mail goes down, you know, you can, you can actually still have complete control over every one of these addresses in that, in that case. But I think for the majority of the users, and one of the reasons why we didn't market it that way is like the majority of users are used to kind of having a at fastmail email address, and now they can kind of have uh, mass email addresses there as well, which is really cool. I think it's definitely pointing out, worth pointing out though, because I was hesitant to sort of switch my email provider uh, to like at fastmail.com, like as much as I like the fastmail service, but understanding that you could use this with, with a custom domain and that it just works flawlessly is a game changer. Like it's it's the opposite of lock in, right? It just it gives your existing email address much more power than I ever had before. Just a brilliant new UX and those uh, wonderful aliases that uh, I actually clicked regenerate to see more of them, which is the opposite. <laughs> it's the opposite of the password generator and one password where I click regenerate because I don't like it. Like and fast me, I'm like show me more, show me more. So 
Yeah, and I think Rick nailed hit the nail on the head on that one where it's like, you know, a lot of companies when they look at doing something like this, they're looking at further lock-in for their users, right? And this is definitely something where you can offboard from one password, you can offboard from fast mail, you can onboard and and kind of this feature can follow you, which is really cool. Yeah, I think uh, I I like that we offer a lot of domains. I, I don't know how many Fastmail has now as ones you can just use. There's there's too many, and many of them I don't know whatever possesses to buy them. But um, it's great that you can sign up and pick whatever domain you want. But I tell everybody, you know, have a domain and and don't do what I do, which is spend you know one day a month spending eight hours looking for the next domain to buy. That's that's not a good habit. But find one, find one domain you can live with and put your life on that because then you can take your life with you wherever you want to go. Yeah, absolutely. So I do want to open up the room for some questions. Um, so if you are in the room, anybody, you want to ask a question of the Fastmail team, the 1Password team, you want to talk about new MacBooks, I'm down for anything. So just request, click the little button in the bottom left-hand corner, request to come up on stage, we'll get you added. Um, I think we're, we try to keep these down to about an hour. So we have some time if we have... Uh, you know, a few extra questions I'm willing to go a little bit over. While I'm waiting for that first person, we're waiting for you to hit the button, I will read out a question that I actually already got on, on Twitter. And this is actually a product question, so it'd be a good one for you, uh, Mitch. I think it'll be a good one for the Fastmail team to talk about because they, they have some of this uh, functionality. So my friend Rob on Twitter, uh, underscore pro sumer underscore, um, asked, I use my personal domain for mass email. I would like to define my own username, one password at mydomain.com, instead of generating one happy.dog 2021 at, at mydomain.com for mass email. Is that something you could add? Or will I reduce my privacy too much by not using random names? So that is the first question. I think uh, it's actually a good product question. So Nick or Mitch, sorry, one of the product people in this house. Do you want to uh, do you want to talk about that one on the spot? So it, it's funny. I I myself have have questions sometimes. Like when should I use my actual email that I'm proud of with my special domain? When should I use a masked email? And I think as I'm slowly getting to the hang of it, I'm sort of becoming more comfortable with just letting Fastmail take over and generate aliases for me, and in a way that. It's kind of like how it started how it felt when I started using a password generator. Because at first you're like, I don't want, I want to know what my passwords are. I want to control them. But then you realize that the best way to do it is not to, to care anymore. And I think that's sort of like what certainly what we're going for. And I, I'm, I'm sure what, what the Fastmail team is going for to like just let them use Nicola's amazing uh, aliases. Don't worry about it. Not set and forget. And customization is great. But the real power is actually just not having to customize it and still getting the best UX and the best security. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I will mention Fastmail does have this alias functionality, so maybe they can speak to that, but I, I have used that as well, where you can go to their dashboard and create one of these things, right? Yeah, that's right. It, it, what we've built with Mast, uh, Mast Email is you just say, I want you to create an alias for me, and then we stick in some data like, well, what domain were you looking at and what are you using it for? But this is built on top of aliases, which have been there for, I mean, a long, long time. And I have a ton of them that, you know, I have one that I give to my kids' teachers and I have one that I give to the uh, to the tax agency. <laughs> uh, and those those I've been given out uh, to whoever wants those. And, and that's what you can do if you don't want a random one. But 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 I agree, uh, random ones are great because you don't have to think about it. I created one the other day. So I actually, I needed to sign up. Um, uh, we're going out of town we're having our dogs stay at this little daycare thing and they have some webcams and they needed an email address, right? And so instead of creating a mass email, I just created a dogs at my domain. And, and, and what's nice about it is I actually have that now going into my fast mail mailbox. And I also have it forwarding a copy to my partner's email address, which I haven't gotten her converted over yet, but I, I'm working on it. Um, <laughs> and so that was like a great example where I was like, oh, I'll just go on Fastmail real quick and create one of these things and, and give it my own custom name. So that was really useful. Yeah. 
And really my advice there is you can you can just say any address at this domain and you can pick a subdomain uh, gets delivered to me. And then if you're at the hardware store and they say, can I have your email address? You can just say very confidently, yes, it's Ace Hardware at my domain. And they'll look really confused, but they'll put it in the system and you're good. Mm, the subdomain is actually helpful too. And I have a ton of domains. So that's actually, that's a good, you know what? I might actually embrace that one. I was worried about spam, but I'll try a wild card and see what happens. On, on the topic of spam and also giving you your email, one of the really cool things is that with the mass email, when you create one in one password, uh, we link directly with FastMail. So you can actually turn on and off that address directly from within one password or by going to FastMail's site and, you know, administering your mass email. So if you're signing for some service or you want to go like to Ace Hardware and give out your email, uh, you can do so with, without feeling like you're giving up something that someone, you know, can always access or can always send you email to. Yeah, Absolutely. All right, so Connor, I don't know who requested first. I apologize, but I've brought in, uh, Connor up on the stage. Do you have a question for the group, my friend? Or comments, of course. Uh, hello, yeah, I think this is brilliant. I've used it already. I think most emails are fantastic. I guess the question follows on from spam. I mean, what about abuse? What if someone, you know, gets a master email and says, oh, yeah, now I can, you know, spam everyone and, you know, do, do bad things? You know, does that, you know, we don't want to get... Fastmail blacklisted. So, does that sort of link back to accounts? And how do you kind of plan to manage abuse? That's a great question. Let me just start by saying this is one of the reasons why we partnered with a company like Fastmail because we didn't want to have to deal with that. Uh, so, I will leave that for uh, one of the Fastmail friends to answer for sure. Yeah. So, I, the the short answer is we already had aliases, and people could already create a lot of aliases, and this doesn't really uh, change the math on that. So this is a problem that we've had to deal with for a long time. This makes it easier for people who, are, who, who want to go through uh, the process of integrating with 1Password to make things that are useful to them. But if you wanted to make a bunch of aliases and do obnoxious things with them, you already had that power. And we already have all of our internal mechanisms for detection, detecting obnoxiousness, which is basically, uh, are, are you sending millions of messages? Are you trying to do very bizarre things? It doesn't really change the math at all. Um, in fact, I think I think it's interesting that the way this makes it easier for people makes it easier for people who are very unlikely to be abusive. Like, why would you go to the extra trouble of integrating this OAuth client to do it when you could just sit at the web and do it? So I haven't seen any problems with it yet. Obviously, we we have to keep our eyes on how things get abused. But so far, it's been great. Yeah, and it, it also feels like one of those ones where people are going to create these email addresses. You wouldn't expect someone to send hundreds of emails from one of them, right? From one of the mass email addresses. Plus, um, but it, the, the the other thing is, I, I don't know if you want to go into details. I'm a little kind of interested, but that is one of the benefits of having like an at fastmail domain where you're already sending hundreds of thousands of messages potentially a day, right? Like, is you you've earned credit as not a spam domain? Is that is that correct? Yeah, that's right. I, the the whole way that email works as as far as who's willing to accept mail from who else is a it's a bizarre world. Um, but by virtue of the fact that we send a lot of mail and people tend to be happy to receive it, we are able to continue sending mail. So using fast mail uh, helps you get your mail delivered, and us uh, making sure your mail gets delivered helps everybody stay happy with the mail they get. But it's it's a weird game. Awesome. All right. Uh, any other questions from the group? I, someone had requested, and just a heads up, sometimes this app like crashes when you come up on stage and when you leave stage. So if you try to request, and I'm talking right now, please feel, there we go. We have, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try to pronounce your name. I apologize. How about you go ahead and introduce yourself once you get on stage without the app crashing and uh, ask your question. My friend waiting, connecting, it says we're working on it. This is why it can't be like quite a podcast, you know? We're we're still exploring a Twitter space. Do 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 connecting. So we might have had a crash. I don't know. This is a perfect opportunity for somebody to <laughs> say something. Madeline, you haven't spoken yet. Uh, what is your sure. favorite thing about the kind of development process of this integration, since this was one of the first big projects you worked on here at 1Password? Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, the feature that, um, aside from JMAP, JMAP was actually the easy part of all of this. 
Um, the hardest slash most interesting part to work on for me was um, we actually had a lot of changes to the underlying data um, and how we handle it in order to um, to bring that toggle masked email on or off feature and bring accurate data to item details. Um, so previously, um, anything that you had saved in one password was static data. Um, and now we check with Fastmail, is this masked email turned on or off? And then if it's, you know, give, give you the appropriate action um, and show in the UI if it's off or on. Um, and that was so much more challenging <laughs> than I thought it was going to be. And um, we had a lot of changes to do, you know, in, in OP7 and OP8 to support it. Um, and that was really interesting because we got to look at a little bit of every single one of the one password apps and, um, yeah, I definitely didn't realize what we were getting into with that, but, um, but it's really cool. And I would love to see more things like that. Yeah. It's a little bit trial by fire, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> for five years. I think Mitch and I have wanted to rewrite the item format for about five years. So, <laughs> Um, it's something where we can do better there to make it easier to add things like this. And that's one of the reasons why we're pushing to one password eight, common code base, um, mm -hmm. you know, getting rid of some of the less used features in one password so that one day very soon we will be able to, um, make the item format, the underlying data that one password uses updated because it really hasn't been updated in about over a decade, which is, you know, decisions were made and uh, we have to stick with a few of them. All right, so I brought uh, D-I-L-J-O-T. I apologize, Kim, I don't wanna mess up your name. Uh, do you have a question for the group, my friend? Hi, yeah, I do. Um, I'm Dil Jot and awesome. I just wanted, I wanted to ask why, you already answered this, but my original question was why didn't 1Password choose to implement the, this themselves? Because that was my gut reaction. I was like, oh no, it's like, a, maybe not, oh no, because Fastmail does sound super cool, but my gut reaction was, oh, you know, I have to sign up for something else. Uh, but you answered that one, and I guess now I have to come up with a new question, but what was that? <laughs> I can expand on that a little bit. I can expand on that while you think of your yeah, next question. You want, sure, How about that? Yeah. So I, I won't yeah, give sure. out any names, but... When we first looked at this, we essentially wanted to do like burner email addresses, right? So you can go out there and you can find these online. Um, I've actually been using them for quite a few years. Um, when I wanted to sign up for kind of a random uh, service or maybe you wanna give a donation and not get added to some random list, right? You can go create a temporary email address and there's plenty of services that do that. And we actually approached the company to essentially handle the back end for that, right? Um, we already run servers in three different parts of the world. We, you know, our enterprise service and our families and individuals, like our bread and butter is basically giving you a good place to secure data. Not, you know, we're not experts in the email service space, right? So we were gonna actually kind of contract that piece out and then kind of call it a, you know, one password, burner mail, whatever you want to call it, feature, right? And quickly, one of the upsides of starting to talk to somebody about that was we learned how involving that really is. Um, so when you're in that kind of space, there is a lot more abuse. Um, they have to like bring up regions and get new IP addresses and they're creating new domains every day. And ultimately the, the service itself wasn't gonna be as nice, right? You'd get maybe a temporary email address for 30 days or something. And that's not great for creating a login item and where you might need to get an email from them in a year or five years or whatever. Um, so that was one reason why we were, eh, maybe we shouldn't go that route. Um, like I said, one of our founders said, hey, uh, I don't want temporary email, I want random email, right? So that was one of the pivots. So that goes into, well, do we want to be the people that essentially have the domains, have the email services and manage that infrastructure. And, um, you know, that is a huge commitment uh, from a business and a company perspective and a technology perspective, but also a downside is 
if those email address, those emails aren't delivered directly into your mailbox, you have to do some things like you have to rewrite the headers, potentially re-sign them. And I think hopefully Rick can probably go into that in more detail, but forwarding email from uh, one point to your mailbox can actually make a lot of those emails get classified as spam or you know you don't re-sign them correctly. There's all of these new email <laughs> protocols that I pretty much know nothing about, except that I have to add random DNS entries to my new uh, uh, domain things or, or to my DNS for these domains that, that really complicate that system, right? So what we basically thought was ultimately for like the end user, for, for everyone to be able to get maximum kind of privacy, security, usability out of this feature, what we want is, you know, you to have your email in your email box, you know, your regular mailbox, but have capabilities provided in your password manager to use that email, right? And so that's where we landed on, let's build something with Fastmail and, and see how that goes. And what's really great about this is, you know, ultimately Fastmail is still com completely responsible for your email. And 1Password is completely responsible for the underlying items that have those email addresses encrypted on your device. And really, you know, it's kind of like this perfect symbiotic relationship. I don't know if that helps answer it a little bit, but if you have another question, I'd be happy to take it. Yeah, no, that was a great answer. Thanks so much. Um, I guess the other thing I wanted to ask was, is there anything like you learned from the Fastmail team just from like working? Cause this like, seems like an interesting collaboration that maybe both sides weren't really expecting. So is there anything like, like cool that you took away from that partnership that you're going to use going forward, I guess, for development and other stuff? So I think um, one thing I learned from the Fastmail team, which is surprising, they actually like to communicate a lot over email, which is surprising. <laughs> like, wow, who would have guessed the email people want to talk over email? Um, so, and, you know, internally, we do a lot of things asynchronously or we use Slack. Um, I don't think Mitch has actually checked his email in like six months, probably, <laughs> you know? So actually Mitch can't get hacked or fished because he never checks his email. So I think that was like, the joke thing that I was like, oh, wow, people still use email for work. This is a very interesting new dynamic. It is helpful, right? Asynchronous communication via something like email versus Slack actually makes it so that you kind of think about and tailor your responses and make them, you know, a little bit better, I think, than your one-off Slack messages of like, yo, 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 what you doing over there? You know what I mean? So I think that was an interesting dynamic. But with that, I think the biggest thing I took away from it was, I think we could have communicated a little bit better throughout the process. So Fastmail was on their side developing some things. We were on our side, we had the API, but when it came down to the final week or two, we were still kind of talking about naming and market, you know, like we had various parts of our company talking to various parts of their company. And as much as I hate a meeting with 15 people, I think if we had, you know, weekly or bi-weekly check-ins, where the people from both sides all came together and gave a quick status update, at least from my perspective, I would have found that super beneficial. And, and I wish I would have uh, kind of proposed to do something like that. Uh, what about you, uh, Rick or Nicola? I mean, the, the number one thing I think we learned is that collaborating with 1Password was a heap of fun, very, um, uh, smart people and very values aligned uh, and um, you know we use email uh, a lot because we have people in very different time zones I'm down here in Australia uh, it's coming up on lunchtime uh, half of our team is over in Philly and then we had uh, the one password team spread across you know another few time zones uh, so email makes sense for us uh, and you know, I can talk for ages about how great Tommy Pops is um, but yes, it's not quite as high bandwidth as as uh, you know real time communication, and sometimes that's that's appropriate. Uh, we could have definitely done with more, if only just because it's so delightful getting together and talking early on in the process. I was having a chat to Bayer, and he was like, "Well, I don't think we can probably talk for more than you know. We don't have much more to talk than than half an hour, but I've allowed an hour in the schedule because we um, we always have so much fun talking to one another. It, we never stop on time." And that's pretty great. Yeah, I would say I have worked with 
companies at one password, not at one password, where you're trying to build something, you're trying to do something, whether it's co-marketing, whether it's a software feature, and you're kind of like, eh, we're gonna do this, but they're not like I would I would hate working at a company, right? Like I could see myself working at Fastmail. Like they are some cool people. They do have the same privacy values that we do. And I think that was, I mean, even, you know, I don't think any of our marketing people here, but they were like, it was so easy to work with them. So if you don't know, um, we had some people on their podcast, they were on our podcast, there's been some various blog posts leading up to this. And everybody that I talked to was like, it is awesome to work with this company because we're used to working with, you know, corporations and businesses that maybe all that matters is the bottom line and not, you know, user privacy and that kind of thing. And that was one of the coolest things working with Fastmail. The other, the other great thing from my perspective is uh, every once in a while, someone would say, well, we're going stick to this, stick this thing into this kind of object. And I could say, tell me more about that kind of object. And I've been using 1Password for, uh, I don't know, 12, 13 years, a long time. And uh, I don't know how it works. I know, I know some of the privacy guarantees, but I don't know any of the structures in which it's storing my data and getting, getting to hear about that was just delighting the programmer in me. I would love to read the, uh, like the, the daily blog of uh, how one password works under the hood, just for the, the enjoyment of seeing how the engineering went. That was a lot of fun. Absolutely. Is there any other uh, questions from the room or I think it's a pretty good place to call it, but if we have one more question from the group or anybody who's already on stage, want to give a, few closing thoughts, feel free. Oh, we got one more question. One more question, bringing you up. I believe it's Derek with Cool Ease coming to the stage. This is the highest, oh, hey, welcome. Hey, yeah, yeah, this is uh, Derek, and uh, I'm a long time one password user and absolutely love it. Um, I've also used an external service um, for um, temporary or permanent mass emails. Um, I signed up with Fastmail and got a custom um, domain and got all that working. But one feature that I really want is to allow um, custom usernames for the mass email addresses instead of the random ones that um, are the only option right now. Um, so I'm hoping that is maybe on the roadmap so you can either use random or specify uh, the username if you have a custom domain with fast mail registered. Yeah. We, uh, <laughs> it was funny when we um, unleashed master email upon the world, we ran an internal sweepstakes on how long it would be before people said we want to be able to specify some part of their username as well as various other things like, you know, oh, this is really great, but I want to use it with this other password manager. I want to use it in this other way. Um, so there's already, we've got a whole bunch of, um, you know, plans and, and directions that we can take this. And this is obviously very high on the list. Uh, I think our sweepstakes came in at about like, I don't know, 40 minutes before someone said, this is cool, but I would like to be able to at least specify part of my uh, username. So believe me, we're very aware of our customer demand in this regard. And we have plans in this i mean we'd like to do something in this space as well as many others but you know it's not really on the we don't have a roadmap at this point for what that might look like because our ideas are full and plentiful yeah absolutely um just to add to that i think we have a few kind of known bugs that we want to work out we want to expose the functionality that we have across one password and then honestly it's users like yourself that will help drive the direction of any future kind of additions to this integration. Um, one of the things that personally I like to do is I love to launch a feature that has um, and, and get the reaction from the community because honestly it builds a heck of a fun community to deal with when, when essentially like people start asking for something and you can deliver it. It's, it's way better than trying to come up with every possible use case, develop every possible use case, launch that, and then find out, oh, well, you know, everybody wants something else, right? So I think that's a really awesome input. I, I read a similar comment um, earlier as well of someone asking for that. So uh, we will absolutely make sure that's tracked. And uh, I, you know, 
random. This is why my team hates working for me. So that was really easy. How hard could it be, right? <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes I get people committed into some work <laughs> without realizing the ramifications. So I won't do that here. And I'll just say, absolutely, uh, you're not the first person to ask for that. And so thank you for your question, comment. And uh, absolutely, we'll uh, get that added to our list of people that we're tracking there. Um, so without further ado, I guess I, uh, I have some family in town, um, haven't seen some of them in years, got a baby shower this weekend. So I am going to jump off here, but really, really thank you, Fast Mail friends, for joining us. I think Nick is recording this, so we'll hand it off some folks and get it up on the uh, YouTube um, for folks to kind of listen to it after the fact. And honestly, you know, I still have JMAC questions. So Rick, if you want to do a Twitter space with me one day where we just jam out and we talk about some more technical details, I would, I would, I will talk there. about JMAP. <laughs> yeah. Any day. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you again for everyone who came out and listened to us and thank you for the folks who asked some questions. Thank you to all the one password people talking about item sharing. And of course, Thank you to the Fastmail friends for joining us on this Twitter space. And you all have a wonderful night, afternoon, morning, whatever time zone you're all in. I really appreciate it. Cheers.